This is the subject is preparing maintenance facilities for alternative fueled vehicles. Today we're going to provide some insight and promote some discussion on what will take to prepare your maintenance facility for alternative fueled vehicles. We will define what these alternative fueled vehicles are, that is LNG, CNG, LPG, and hydrogen, and we will review the hazards that go along with these fuels. In addition, we'll, we'll investigate some of the various codes and ordinances that influence the design of your and, and modification of your facility. We'll also then look at the equipment that's a part of this whole operation that includes the detection, the, alar the alarming, and the mitigation. And then finally, we'll take a look at the cost of ownership. So let's take a look at some of the fuels we're talking about. The first one, the most prominent one we see in the markets today, is natural gas. Natural gas is a, is a naturally produced gas, and it is lighter than air. It is odorless in its natural form and it has a, an explosive level of 5% by volume. That what is it, making 100% LXEL. It comes in two forms, both compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas. Compressed natural gas is at atmospheric temperature and pressures that vary from 3600 up to 4000 psi. LNG on the other hand is at atmospheric pressure but it is a cryogenic temperature down to minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit to make it a liquid. Hydrogen, the lightest element in our periodic table, has a 4% by volume uh, explosive level. It is much lighter than air. It is odorless as well, and it is used as a fuel in two methods, both as a combustion fuel and also in fuel cells to generate electricity. Propane, one that's most commonly seen by the, the regular homeowner, is used as at a 2.1% by volume this gas, though, is heavier than air. will have a tendency to migrate onto the floor. It is all, also odorless, and it is liquefied for storage and for transportation as a gas. Now let's take a look at some of the codes that are involved in the design of our facility. The first one that we'll look at, and the one that we see most often is the international, from the International Code Council, is the IFC, or the International Fire Code. It is section 2311.7, and this is where the requirement for gas detection for non-odorized gases comes from. And it will also, the first code that indicates that the gas detection system shall be in a performance approved system. Also in, in, in the ICC is the International Mechanical Code and the International Building Code. Additional ordinances or codes that we see are the NFPA. The most predominant one is the NFPA 30A, which defines both what a major and a minor repair, talks about the amount of mitigation requirement, gives a classification for a garage. If you take for just a minute and think about the fact that in the, the days of diesel and heavier than air fuels, you would have the lower 18 inches of your maintenance facility was rated as a class one div two environment. Now that we've put even lighter than air fuels into it, we're going to also add the upper 18 inches of our garage to be a class one div two environment. This becomes very important when we have things up there that are non-classified and we need to talk about removing them or moving them. If we put ventilation up in this area, we can then also help to declassify it. So if we move so many changes of air per hour up in that upper 18 inches, that will help to declassify the area and other considerations need to be involved in that case. For example, the cost of moving that air and heating that air. Additional National Fire Protection Agency codes that are involved in alternative fuels would be NFPA 52, the Vehicular Gas Fuel Code, NFPA 88A, which dictates what happens in a parking structure, NFPA 59, which handles the, the uh, utility gases such as LPG. It's always, it's always important for me to note that although these are recommended code practices and ordinances, the most important thing is that unless these are adopted by the local authority having jurisdictions, they don't necessarily become law. Until the local authority has adopted them, that's when they become an ordinance or a law, and that's when they'll be a part of what the new regula regulations are. Now let's take a look at some design considerations. The most significant one seems to be is whether your facility is a major repair facility or a minor repair facility. A minor repair facility might be a facility that's only working on tires. A major repair facility, like the name would indicate, would be one that is working on the fuel system or the engine or even body work is considered major repair. 
One of the things that uh, NFPA 52 would ask you to do is to solicit the use of a qualified engineer, someone who has a professional engineering stamp or is qualified to work on these types of facilities. Another consideration is the building structure. Is it peaked? Is it a flat roof? Is it uh, got a lot of pits in it uh, for working on, on uh, vehicles? That type of thing. Also, you want to take a look at the natural ventilation of the building. We have several ventilation buildings in Southern California, for example, that don't have walls. So therefore, putting a uh, detection system with ventilation didn't have a lot of bearing on the system itself. You want to look at the surrounding buildings. You don't want to put your neighbors into jeopardy. You want to make sure whatever you've got going there, they're aware of and the surrounding buildings are protected as well. Security. I always tell a little story of a job that we did in downtown Chicago where we actually rolled the doors of the maintenance facility up when there was a gas alert so that we could get fresh air in. We discovered that when the gas alert occurred at 3 o'clock in the morning, as we rolled the doors up, the tools went out the door. Subsequently, there can be things done to cons for security consideration. Instead of using rolling the doors up for makeup air, you could, for example, use vents to ventilate that. Occupation. Is the building occupied 24 hours, 7 days a week? Finally, ignition sources. Where are the heaters, the grinders, the welders? Where are these devices and how are you going to protect the building if there is an excursion of gas from these devices? Finally, geographical and climical. Climate consideration. It's not strongly recommended that you open the doors up in North Dakota in the wintertime as a result, in order to be able to ventilate the gases, but it may be necessary. All right, let's take a look at gas detection. Presently, we look at gas detection in two forms. First of all is portable, and then second is fixed. Portable is used as a personal protection device. You'll probably see this in any of the guys that are working in the city and they go down into a manhole. These are devices that are uh, on their body. They are not accepted as a system for monitoring gas in these facilities. Fixed is exactly like the name would indicate that is permanently installed in the facility and it is used to monitor the gas in that building. Of the fixed systems, there are two types. The first type is a controller-based system, where all of the output functions, that is the control of the fans, the control of the horns and the strobes, uh, the functions for the user to use are all based in a single controller. The second type of system is a sensor-based system, and we used to call these in the instrumentation world a distributive system. But what it really means is that the sensors themselves have the control functions for handling the alarms and the horns. There's no fixed main control box. The controller-based systems, the pros for those are that the interface is a single point. There's one point for the first responders to go to. It is easier to install. It requires less wiring. It is typically always third-party approved for performance. And it's simpler, it has a much simpler uh, calibration technique. The one downside to it is that it is size limited. In the case of a sensor based system, just like uh, against our controller based system, it's a lot more flexible in system design. It has 30 third party approvals for the sensors only. It requires data wires and power wires, so subsequently more wiring. And the calibration can be a little bit more cumbersome because it generally requires you to go to the sensor or close to the sensor as possible. A third type that we're seeing now is an open path. The asset or pro on this particular one is that it's less cost per area. Now we stop and say, okay, an open path is simply this. We're taking a transmitter and a receiver and we're beaming a beam of, of light over a long distance and we're looking for gas in that area. So it covers a larger area. There are fewer components involved in an open path. It is less accurate for identifying where the actual leak of gas is. If I had a series of buses in a row and the open path was above them, I'll know there's a leak in one of those buses, but I don't necessarily know which one. They are a little bit more difficult to install because they require alignment. So you're aligning these tools to each other. And finally, it's not always accepted by some of the local authorities having jurisdiction as an acceptable system. Open path, by nature, as I indicated before, indicates that it's got a beam that it's looking for a cloud of gas in. And we talk about an open path, the amount of gas is one LEL per meter. Now if I had 25% LEL gas in 20 meters, I would have one LEL meter. 
So in other words, if I was one-fifth of the way to the explosive level in 20 meters, I would then be one LEL meter. Conversely, if I had 100% LEL, that is enough gas to be explosive, in one meter, I'm still one LEL meter. Now, I don't know where I'm at in that beam, but I'm now at an explosive level. So you can see there's a little drawback to the open path technology. The sensor technology itself that we're seeing right now for all our, rel our alternative fueled maintenance shops include the catalytic bead sensor used for combustibility, infrared also used for combustibility, and electrochemical used for toxicity, CO, NO2, those types of things. The catalytic bead type technology measures both hydrogen and methane. So and it will also be performance approved by a nationally recognized test laboratory for performance like UL2075 or Factory Mutual 6320 and CSA 22.2.152. It requires a periodic calibration. In some cases that can be 90 days. In other cases it can be as long as 180 days. The technology is fairly simple. It's a Weestone bridge that has two beads attached to a, a platinum wire. As the gas attacks one of the beads, it changes the resistance and gives a proportional level to the amount of gas. It is one of the oldest technologies we use today for uh, measuring combustible gases, and it is the only acceptable technology for measuring hydrogen. Infrared, by, the, by its simple head, is exactly that. It's an infrared transmitter to a receiver. And at point level, it's all located basically in the device itself. So we have a transmitter and a receiver there. It's great for light hard hydrocarbons. And again, it's strictly for hydrocarbons such as methane or propane. It is located within 18 inches of the ceiling. It is a very low measurement, large measurement range. In other words, it can read from zero to as much as 100% by volume. It requires an annual calibration interval. And it's a great deal more accurate and stable. And these devices are also performance approved. Electrochemical, those devices we use for CO and for uh, nitric oxide are what we call electrochemical and those devices are located in the breathe zone. In my case that's four feet and some other people's cases that might be as high as seven feet. But it's generally in that area where you're going to be breathing. They generate electric current based on the amount of chemical that's around them. They're highly sensitive for parts per million of toxic gases and they're specific to the gas of interest, CO or NO2. Let's take a look at the sensor technologies. Here we actually see a bus barn, and if you look very carefully up in the ceiling, you can see an infrared sensor up within the 18 inches of the ceiling. These are all set up in an array, and they are there to measure the amount of gases that may be excreting from the buses themselves. Here's a closer view of it, and you can see the sensor up there with the uh, sensor element pointed down. And here's what the controller system would look like. You have the battery backup. This is a life safety system. You have the basic controller itself. You have a local horn and strobe. And then you have a calibration cabinet. Now this cabinet allows us to calibrate the sensors without getting to the sensors. We have to go to the controller, put it into calibration as an example, and then calibrate them using the tubes to send the gas to it. Right to the next is a CO sensor in the breathe zone we talked about. Here we see that same CO sensor in a much close up view. Now here is an infrared sensor it's used in an LPG application. So we have a heavier than air gas, it's down at the base of this column, and we're monitoring for, for a heavier than air fuel. Now here's one that's in the pit. So there's a maintenance pit that they do maintenance on a bus, and you'll see that they have a sensor located in the base of the pit. Design considerations for the sensors themselves. Where are they going to be located? The spacing. What's the height? If it's combustible, is it hydrogen or methane? Is it going to be up in the ceiling? Is it propane? Is it going to be down below? Is it toxic, carbon monoxide or nitrogen dioxide? Is it going to be something that we need to have in the breathe zone? And finally, I always say that the location and the height is common sense. Where you think the bus might leak or the car might run, that's where you need to put them. Let's look at the second aspect of uh, the modifications of our facility, and that becomes the alarming and notification process. 
Notification by those codes that I mentioned earlier requires that at a 25% level, we evacuate the building. So we're already going to be a monitoring for 25% of one quarter of the way of that natural gas or that particular fuel getting to an explosive level. We're then going to send off audio visual alarms, just like a fire alarm system, to have them evacuate the building. We have to make it audible so that everybody can hear. We have to make it ADA compliant so that if it's a series of strobes, they're synchronized, as an example. We have to make it first responder intuitive. In other words, if I'm a first responder coming to a building and now it's had a release of gas, do I understand what's going on and what's happening now? And I'll show you some examples of how that can be important. And then finally, when, when they need to know when they can come back after an evacuation. One of the important things to understand about a gas detection's audible system is that it needs to be different than that of a fire system. You don't want somebody thinking there's a fire alarm when it's actually a gas alarm. And in some municipalities and some jurisdictions, you may have an auto dialer that's a part of that. So here we see a series of audible visual type of enunciators. The important picture there on the right shows you, or on your left, shows you the green light saying the building is safe, gives you an amber light that tells you that it's got a ser an issue, and a red light that says that we've evacuated the building. Now, what we've done as an education for some first responders is that once we get a red light, we latch that red light on, but if the building, the gas is mitigated, if the ventilation takes the gas out, we then turn the green light back on. That's what I call giving the uh, first responders some intuitive as to what's happened in the building. Now another thing is this is an in interior one. Again, green light, amber light, and red light. Now what I use here is two things. First of all, to show the difference between a gas alarm and a fire alarm. Fire alarm being red with a clear strobe. The gas alarm being white with a blue strobe. But it also is important there is signage to let people know what's happening. So let's talk about mitigation. How do you get the gas out? We've already indicated we've got the gas, what do we do? Well, first thing we use is natural airflow. Where's it gonna move? Where's it gonna go? Is it gonna go over the ceiling? Is it gonna stick there? Is it gonna stay on the floor? Is it gonna go in the pits? Pressurization of local offices. If I've got a parts room or an office, sometimes by kicking the pressure up in that area, you can actually prevent the gas from migrating in there. So you're saving them having to put a detection system in. Exhaust in the air. It's a simple push-pull system. In other words, you're going to Bring air in, fresh, and pull the old air out. Air is 100%, we want to make sure the air is moving at a value of 100% per cubic foot per minute. So you're moving as much air as you possibly can. The air handling units will push the air into the building and it will exhaust it back out again. The two modes that we talk about for ventilation are normal and emergency. Normal being what you and I would work on if we were mechanics or in that facility where it's normal just flow of air. Emergency being the high volume of air in order to mitigate the gases out. These are a little bit more detail on each of those, whereas a normal is one CSM per cubic foot, and then a high would be eight times per, per an hour. Let's take a look at some of the ventilation. The ventilation all the way on, the, on your right is a ventilation used in an LNG facility where the liquefied natural gas may pool on the floor and as a result we want to get it before it actually gets to the ceiling. The other one is an actual vent exhaust that we see in the ceiling that we use to help to mitigate it. Another consideration in our mitigation is security. If we have doors, as I indicated, that may be in an environment that would, that would cause us to lose asset, we might want to, for example, ventilate the doors instead of actually open them up. We then also want to shunt trip any non-essential powers. For example, you don't want the powers to turn off, you want to turn the powers off to anything that could be an ignition source, grinders, computers, whatever. And then you want to remember that when you're working in the top 18 inches of that facility, being a class one div two requirement, you must follow the NFPA um, 70 or the National Electric Code's requirements for explosive environments. And finally, the emphasis I always make is signage. It's imperative that we let people know what's happening because our hope is these systems never activate, but in reality, we want to tell them what's happening when they do. Finally, let's take a look at the cost of ownership. One of the biggest questions that's asked of most of us involved in this process is what is it going to cost for me to convert my facility or to build a new one? The things you need to consider is 
obviously the mitigation, what is my utility going to be cost to move four changes of air per hour at 72 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of Minnesota in January? Well, that's obviously going to be more costly than to move a little bit of air in Southern California in the summertime. So those are the things to consider. I finally got a number from somebody that once told me that it runs about installation design everything about $75,000 to $150,000 per maintenance bay. Now those are fairly conservative numbers because the individual was, that I was working with has done a bunch of these and gave me fairly conservative numbers. But not only do we consider the cost of ownership for the install, but what does it cost to maintain it? These systems like a fire alarm system have to be periodically checked. So an annual cost runs about $25 to $150 per sensor for calibration and check. And that would be predicated on whether you need to have a ladder or scissor lift to get to each of those sensors. And the final thing is you want to make sure that every year you full test the system. We have one system in Southern California that every year we do not tell the fire department, we don't tell the local occupants. We actually set the system off and make sure they understand the process of going through the evacuation. And finally, the key element is safety. This is a life safety system.